Okay, so today I will show you how to use three different displays, the 7 segment 4 digits display, the 16 by 2 character display and the 128 by 64 pixel OLED display. And as you can see everything is driven by a single microcontroller getting the value from the temperature sensor. This video will be a little bit different because this time I will not be using Arduino but instead I will use this, which is the Raspberry Pi Pico Advanced Kit from Ilikau and they were very kind to send me this kit for review. This is a complete kit and as you can read here it has a lot of sensors, it has a lot of lessons and as a final product you can build this smart car but again this time I'm mainly interested in displays and how hard or easy would it be to use those together with the Raspberry Pi and writing the code in MicroPython. So let's get started. The first and the most important part that you have to find in the list of components is this one, which is the Raspberry Pi. And you can see it has the pins pre-soldered, which is great. And then you have to find this USB cable and connect it to the Raspberry Pi and to your PC. So I will do this right now. The next step will be opening the documentation. And as you can see here on web page number six, we have to burn a firmware in order to use the Raspberry Pi with the MicroPython. And it might sound scary, but it really is just copying one file to the Raspberry Pi. So you open this website and it is very helpful with the steps. So you download the file, then you press the boot button on the Raspberry Pi and connect it to your PC. It will appear as a new device and copy this file to this new device. So let's try it. I will click this link to download the UF2 file. I will also connect the Raspberry Pi and it already appeared as a new device. So I'll just drag this file into this new folder. And that should be it for this part. The next part, according to documentation, is to install a software, the IDE called Tony. So let's do that. And there are multiple different versions to choose from. I will most likely go with installer. It will be hopefully the easiest one to use. In the installer, just click the next button until everything is installed. And since this is a pretty straightforward process, I'll just speed up this section a little bit. And once everything is installed, this is how the Tony application looks like. We still have to do one last step, and that is to set the interpreter to MicroPython. So I'll go to Tools, Options. And in the interpreter tab, I will select the MicroPython, Raspberry Pi MicroPython. You can manually select the port, but it's probably better to have this automatically detected. I will click the OK button and hopefully in the bottom right corner, I will see that now I have the Raspberry Pi Pico found and connected on a certain port. Again, all those steps are also described in the documentation, so you can go there and find out the details. With everything installed, let's try some program. And the documentation includes the simplest possible program for blinking the onboard LED, which is this code. So I'll just copy it and paste it on the Tony application. The problem is the formatting will not be preserved. So if I press the run button, you will see there is some kind of error because this while loop as well as this inside has to be indented. So I'll press the tab button. Now it looks like the code inside the PDF file. So if I press the run button now, now I should see the onboard LED blinking for 100 milliseconds to be on and 100 milliseconds to be off. So it's quite a fast blinking. I can try to change it to, for example, half a second, so 500 milliseconds. Click the run button again, and now it should be much slower. So this was pretty quick. It was a really nice experience in getting this set up, and it took no time to really get the onboard LED blinking. So as of right now, I'm pretty satisfied with the progress. Let's see how hard it will be to use the individual displays. The documentation not only includes details how to connect everything properly, but also those 32 individual lessons. And you can see that those lessons always start with the description of the individual components, what this project is about, and how to connect everything together. The last part is always the code. The good news is that you don't have to copy the code from the PDF file, because as you've seen previously, the, the formatting will not always be preserved, but you can also download the code in the form of zip file. And you can see that this is the extracted zip file with the individual lessons, and it includes all the code you need. So let's just quickly glance over the projects. You can see there are some interesting interesting ones, but we are mainly inter interesting in the first one that uses the display, which I believe is the lesson number 19, which is called electronic clock. And this one is using the seven segment four digit display. Same as many other modules in the set, this display has also a dedicated chip, which is responsible for driving the individual digits, which means that instead of using 10 wires, we can only use four of those. So the clock, the data in and out, VCC, which is a power supply and the ground. After connecting it based on the documentation, it could look something like this. Note that I'm not using breadboard this time just because I'm only using four wires. The display is not showing anything yet, but let's expect it. Let's jump back to the Tony application and open the example number 19 for the electronic clock. And as you can see right, the first line says import TM1637, which is library to drive the same named chip, which is used on this board to drive the individual digits. But we need to first install this library and we do it in a way that we select view files, locate the downloaded files for the individual lessons, open the lesson 19, the library folder, and there should be a TM1637.pi file that is the library. So we'll right click and select upload to slash, which means upload to the root directory of the 
Raspberry Pi. So I'll click OK. And it will be uploaded. You can see now it's inside the Raspberry Pi Pico, which means that I can now click the Run button to upload this electronic clock.pi file to the Raspberry Pi as well. And as I do so, hopefully I should see a ticking clock. Now, if you look closely to the code, you can see that they are just setting some random value in the beginning and then increasing the seconds, minutes, and hours. So it's not a real time, but it looks like a real time on the display. Obviously, we would need some real time clock module to get the real time. So this is just displaying some values that look like the time. Let's try to do some slight change to the code. So select everything in the loop and comment it out. So select edit, comment out. And let's just copy first line for setting the number value as a new line. And I will say I want to print 1, 2, 3, 4. So 1, 2 or 12 for the first digit, 33 for the second digit. And let's just say I want to show the column. So I'll click upload and hopefully my display will now show 1, 2, 3, 4 together with the column, which is true. If I open the documentation for the used library, you can see there are some nice examples using the write function, the show function, even hex function and numbers, even the temperature function. And there is also a nice explanation how to create your own characters using those seven segments. Basically, you will choose which of those segments you want to light up and then you set the corresponding bits to zeros or ones. Note that the most significant bit, this is this one, the first one sets the column, but it's only present on the second digit. So setting this first byte will not have any effect on other digits. With that said, I think that there is a little chance that you will want to create your own characters because all the basic ones even the, including the full alphabet and some special symbols are already covered so let's try to use this code to show some different values strings and numbers in the display i will copy the code into tony and insert a sleep of two seconds in between those individual comments after that let's press the run button and see how it looks like on the display so now we see all the possible ways how to display digits text or addressing individual segments of the display and I really like how many options we have. I mean, this library is using this display to its limit. It's hard to think of anything else that you would want to display with just those four digits and one column. One minor note is that the temperature only shows degrees Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Anyway, let's move this display aside and move to another one. And that will be this one, which is 16 by 2 character display. And you can see that on the back there is another board soldered in, which is often called backpack. And that allows for using the i c connection. So only four wires instead of a lot of wires for the parallel communication. And the first lesson that uses this display is lesson number 22 called billboard and then simply scrolls the text around the display. So let's connect the display according to this table and see what we get. So as soon as the display is connected, it should immediately shine. The first line should be filled and the second line should be empty. If you don't see anything, try rotating the trimmer on the backside of the board. Thankfully, there is a screwdriver in the kit which you can easily change from flat head to the Phillips head like that. So once you have the contrast set properly, let's jump back to Tony. In here, I'll open the project, but before uploading the project, I first need to upload the library. So I will open the lesson 22 library folder and right click for both of those PI files and select upload to slash upload to root folder of the Raspberry Pi Pico. Okay, so click the run button and see what happens. And immediately we get some error. It's on line seven, which is the initialization of the LCD. And I'm pretty sure that someone was testing this project and it was working. So let's see what could be wrong. So first of all, the display is not two by 26, it's two by 16, but I will talk about this in a minute. I think that what could be wrong is the I2C address, which is currently set to three F. So I will run this I2C scanner application, which I found somewhere on the internet. And if I press the run button, you can see that one I2C device was found and the address is different and the address is zero X 27. So what I will do is I will inside the billboard, I will change this address to be 27 instead. And let's see what happens if I press the run button now. The display is rightly showing the hello Pico message, so it's working just fine. Let's talk about the 2x26 size, which really should be 2x16. And you will notice as I change this to 2x16 and run this again, now it's being wrapped to second line. So I believe that setting this to 2x26 was intentional change to make sure that the text is not being wrapped to a second line. But I guess there are better ways how to do the same thing. Anyway, now that we have fixed the size and the i squared address, I'm interested in printing some custom characters. So if I look at the documentation for the used library, down here there is an example of how to create the custom characters, which is of course called custom characters. And it's really simple you just define the pixels to be on and off and here is an example of some smiley happy face where you just define which of those pixels should be off in that case it will be zero or which of those should be on in this case it will be one and it's being converted to the hexadecimal number and defined as an array now in order to print the custom character you have to do three steps actually you have to first define the array then you have to define a new custom character using the custom car function for the lcd and finally you have to print it and usually the lcd will have up to 80 different characters and you just print it as an error character just using the character value which will be from 0 to 7. So let's just try to copy this into our code. So I need those two lines that I will copy into the Tony application and I've just created a copy of my code and before I do that I will comment out this piece of code. So comment out this one and paste those two new lines and then we have to of course print it. 
So I will copy this line, put character number zero and print it as well. Now if I hit the run button, I should see the smiley face being displayed on the LCD. Actually a lot of smiley faces because we are just flooding this with smiley faces. So that's working just fine. Let's see if we can create our own character. And since we want to display a temperature, that could be for example a degree symbol. And there are multiple online tools to help you with that. I like this one because it allows you to create multiple characters at once. So we want something like a degree symbol which could look something like this or perhaps be a little bit bigger like so, or we can as well combine the degree character with the C symbol for the Celsius or with an F for the Fahrenheit. And you can see that I'm not using the last line because if you want to combine this with built-in characters, those are also not using this, this last line because that one is being used for a cursor. If you want to create your own graphics, you don't have to care about that size, but if you want to combine it with like digits from the built-in library, it will look strange if you would use the last line. So let's just for example use this third character, which will be this one. So I will select this third line with the third character. I'm not copy it in Tony, but the problem is that this is for Arduino and the bytes for Arduino are being written in a different way. So if I switch to documentation, so you can see that inside the MicroPython it's being written as a zero and small b, whereas in here for Arduino it's written as capital B. So as I copy it in Tony, I will copy it in a new tab and actually have to perform a find and replace. So I'll replace a capital B with zero and small b and select replace all and now it's being recognized as individual bytes. So I'll copy it in our code and actually not use the byte array, but instead I will just only use brackets and paste it like this. So now when I press the run button, I should see our degree symbol with the C for Celsius. Again, it's filling the entire display and it's called happy face, which is no longer true, but we will fix that in a minute. For now, let's see if we can create some kind of thermometer graphics. We would need the starting piece and the ending piece and the in-between pieces which could be filled or unfilled and I've also created one which is uh, partially filled. Of course, we could create more, but that should be enough for now. Once we have those done, I will copy the code into a new tab inside Tony and perform the same find and replace. So replace capital B with zero small b, change the brackets and set some meaningful names. Now we can copy this into our code and create more custom characters. For that we will be using characters 1 through 5. Let's not print our funny face, which is actually the degree symbol, but instead let's just try to create some kind of visualization for the actual thermometer. So we will start with the starting piece, then print out a few filled pieces, then the semi-filled piece, a few empty pieces, and finally end with the end piece. Make sure that the number of characters is of course 16, so we can fit one line. And since I think that's true, let's press the run button and see what we get on the display. And you can see that they actually show two thermometers because it just continues to print those characters all over again. And when it reaches the end of the line, it will jump to the next line. I guess that's fine because we will print on the second line right now. And we will say LCD put string and our string will be temperature, some random number for now, plus the character number zero, which is a degree symbol with Celsius. And just so that we fill all the 16 characters, I will put the double fill in here. So let's just press the run button and see what we get. And finally, we are getting somewhere where it shows the temperature as well as the icon or graphics for the thermometer. So I guess that's fine for the 16 by 2 character display. We'll jump back to it later on when we, when we provide real values. But for now, let's move this display aside and jump to the last one. And that would be this 128 by 64 pixel OLED display. Again, using just four wires because it uses chip which use the I2C connection. And when I look at the documentation, the first project that uses this display is this lesson number 26, electronic wall calendar. However, it also uses this temperature and humidity sensor, which we don't really need for our project. So what I will do is I will connect the display based on this table and then just open this code in Tone, which is this one. But before actually uploading this to Raspberry Pi, I will try to remove all the DHT elements and only keep the minimum. So I don't definitely need this one. I don't need those lists. This is also for the DHT. I don't need to set any time or set any date or date change or time change. So all of this could be easily deleted from the code, which will leave us with just this small little loop. And this one is also using some temperature sensor, so I'll just not use it. Actually, I only need three lines. I want to print some text, then show it on the old display. And it's probably all I need. For the text itself, let's just say hello world. And after pressing the run button, we should hopefully see the text hello world being displayed on the OLED display, which is true. So we are making some great progress in here. 
If I open the documentation, you can see there are some functions to draw something like filling the entire screen, drawing some pixels, lines, rectangles and filled rectangles. And there's also this example for drawing the Biker Python logo and some text. So I think that I will just copy this into Tony and see how it looks like on the display. So just copy this code, then paste it in here. Make sure that the indentation is right. So tap key two more times and press the run button. And you will see there is an error because this display isn't defined. And that's because our display is actually called OLED and not a display. So I'll perform and find a replace. So I'll replace display with OLED like so, replace all. And now when I press the run button, hopefully I should see this running on the display, which is true. So I can see a nice logo and the text. Unfortunately, I don't see any way how to draw the actual bitmap, which is disappointing because drawing bitmaps is probably the best thing to do with all of the displays. However, since we can set the individual pixels, we can probably still draw the bitmap by ourselves by toggling those individual pixels. For that, of course, we would need some kind of bitmap. For that, I will be using Photopia, which is a free online editor, very similar to Photoshop. I will start with the document sized 128 by 64 pixels and start drawing some shapes. I'm mainly using the circular and the rectangular selection together with the stroke and fill commands. This time I will not describe every single step, but if you are interested in how to use the Photopia tool, I would suggest you to watch my other videos where I use this tool as well. You can see that I'm adding the tick marks and in the next step I will also add some placeholder text, but I will make sure to have some space below the text to actually print something from Raspberry Pi. That way I can make the screen look nice while still displaying some change in text from, from the Raspberry Pi. As the last step, I will add the threshold effect to really have only black and white pixels. When the image is complete, I will select File, Export as a PNG file. And Export as a PNG file, of course, I will first set the name and make sure that the size of the image is the same as the size of the display, which is 128 by 64 pixels. Once we have this image, we will use the online tool called Image to CPP to convert the image into zeros and ones. And it sets Arduino code, but we can surely use this with MicroPython as well. So I'll drag this PNG image over the choose file and you can see the preview in here. We don't have to change anything except for clicking the generate code. And it will generate us the array of zeros and ones, of course, converted into hexadecimal numbers. But what it's doing is just scanning the image. And if there is a pixel in the black color, it will say zero. If there is a pixel in the white color, it will say one. And you can see, so this is first eight pixels. And 8 pixels and then just continues to the next line and so on and so on. So before we actually use this in our code, let's just try to do something more simple and that is drawing one pixel or perhaps all pixels with the same color. So back in Tony, I will comment out most of the stuff except for the OLED show, which is for updating the screen. So select edit comment out and I want to create a simple loop. So I will say for Y in the, in the range of all the pixels in my display that actually goes from zero to 228 times 64. So that's all the pixels on the OLED screen. I want to say OLED pixel and fill some pixel for the X and Y position with some color, which will be one for white. So the X position will be somehow related to the number Y and we can say that it could be Y modulo 100. 28, so it will always return a value between 0 and 128. For the y position, we can say something similar. We can say y divided by 128. So it will be 0 for the first line, 1 for the second line, and so on. But since this will return a floating point number, we have to first convert it into the integer. So if I do it like so, I can now press the run button and hopefully all my pixels should be white on the display, which is exactly the true. So now what's left to do is instead of drawing always the white pixel, we want to get the value from our array. Let's place the array somewhere before the while loop, like so. So this is just a set of numbers. I will put those inside the brackets and I will create a new variable. So once this is inside the brackets, I will say, for example, new variable called image equals this array. Now we want to, of course, use this image when getting the pixel value. So inside the loop, I will say I want to get the pixel value from the image, which is an array, and I want to use some index. I cannot use the index i because that goes from zero to quite a big number, but the values inside the array are hexadecimal numbers. So one number means eight pixels. So we have to divide this by eight. So i divided by eight. And since this will end up as the floating point number, I want to convert this to integer. So integer i divided by eight should be the index, at least for now. I can try pressing the run button, but I'll probably see something wrong. And that's because for every eight pixels, we are only using the first value or some value from the image array. What we want to do is we want to use individual bits. So for every byte, we want to get the deep values of individual eight bits. And after a little bit of Googling, I have found this Stack Overflow question. So thank you, Brian Bundy, for providing the answer. So if you use the AND bitwise operator and AND by one, you will get the first bit. If you say use do, you will get the second bit. But uh, this is important. The four will be the third bit and it will go on like this. So four, eight, 16, 32, and so on. So in our code, I will create a new helper variable called counter. And I will say that the counter equals i module eight, which means that it will always go from zero to seven. So that will be the bit which we are looking for. And then we want to create a number based on this 
this which will be 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, which is of course the powers of 2. So I'll say the counter is the 2 raised by the counter of course. So the next step will be saying this image array and counter. Let's try to press the run button and see what we get. And we get some kind of image. It looks somehow like the one which we drawn, but it at the same time looks very wrong. And what's wrong is we are writing the bits in the reverse order. So you can see that each eight bits are actually flipped vertically. We can easily fix it by saying that uh, when we get the counter, instead of going from zero to seven, we will go backwards. So we'll say seven minus this one, and hopefully it should fix it. So let's press the run button one more time. And now we see the image in the full glory. So that's great. Let's make one more change, and it is to still print some text. So I will say OLED text and print out 25C for Celsius. And that should be it for now. So let's press the run button and we can see our image, full screen image, together with the text that is being drawn below the image. And now it's time to read some real data. For temperature, we can use something like this, which is DHT11. That's a simple temperature and humidity sensor. But we actually don't need to use any external sensor at all because the Raspberry Pi Pico board has the onboard built in temperature sensor. And the sensor is directly connected to one of the analog to digital converters. So we just read the value of the voltage and convert it somehow to degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit. And I found this great article which describes all the details. So let's scroll down to find the code, which is this one. And it first reads the ADC, which is analog to digital converter of number four, which is where the temperature sensor is being connected to. It converts it to voltage. So the voltage is 3.3 volt and the analog to digital converter could go from zero to 65,535, which is a 16 bit number. And then we use this equation to convert it to degrees Celsius, print it out and sleep for two seconds. So let's just try to copy this into Tony, new tab, and try to write on the Raspberry Pi Pico. And hopefully Hopefully we will immediately see some value which is a temperature in degrees Celsius. If you are interested in the degrees Fahrenheit, I believe there is this equation down here which converts this Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit. So now we know how to get the value of the built-in temperature sensor of the Raspberry Pi Pico. And we've also tried to connect all three displays. So it's now time to put everything together, get the real value of the temperature, but at the same time display this on all three displays at the same time. So we have this 16 by 2 character display which is using the I2C connection and it has actually the address defined. So I don't think that there will be any problem with this being connected to any I2C for C output for the Raspberry Pi Pico. The four digit display is also using two wires, so the clock and the data in and out. But after checking the documentation, this is actually not the I2C connection. It's similar, but it's not using any kind of addressing. So I'm hoping that we can connect this to any digital pins. Finally, there is this OLED display, which is using the I2C connection, but unfortunately, I don't see any address being defined during the initialization phase. So even when the display might have some I2C address, we are probably not using it. And that might be a problem for something like Arduino, but thankfully there is an easy solution for the Raspberry Pi Pico. If I open the pinout diagram, you can see that the Raspberry Pi Pico has two separate I2C lines. So it has I2C0 and I2C1, and there are quite so many pins where you can use those I2C lines. So what we can do is we can use I2C0 for the one display, for example, for the 16x2 display, and I2C1 for the OLED display. And this way, those two displays could have totally same I2C address, or they, we don't have to use I2C address at all. Also keep in mind that when you are connecting to different pins, when you define a pin in the code, it means the screen number. So GP0 is a pin number zero. Those gray numbers, they shouldn't be used. They are just for confusion. And here is the final code. I've really just taken bits and pieces from the individual programs and copied everything into one place. So as the first thing, we define pins for the four digit seven segment display, which are pins zeros and ones. I believe those were the ones used in the original sketch as well. Then for the 16 by two display, the character display, we use pins eight and nine. And this is eight square C number zero. And finally, for the 128 by 64 OLED display, I use pins 14 and 15, but this time this is I square C1, so I have to put one in here. And really, you can use so many pins, so I just use the pins 14 and 15 for the OLED display, just because it was easier for me to connect it on the breadboard. And you can see here it's I square C1, whereas for the pins 8 and 9 used for the character display, this is I square C0. Again, for the 7 segment display, it's not using I square C connection, so you can use any kind of pins. I've used 0 and 1 for the easy connection on the breadboard. If I scroll down in the code, in the main function before I actually go into the infinite loop, I define the custom characters for the 16x2 character display because those could be only defined once and that the image for the OLED display, which is this full screen 128 by 64 pixel image. Another change compared to my previous code is I also draw this image before I go into the while loop. So I draw this image for the OLED display because it takes some time and I don't need to actually redraw it every cycle because it's not changing. And then inside the loop, I read the temperature from the built-in sensor and round it to have no decimal place for the seven segments 
segment digit display than to have one decimal point for the 16 by 2 character display and actually two decimal points for the OLED display. And just because I'm not updating the display all the time with the full screen image, I have to first draw the rectangle below the text, otherwise those numbers will get scrambled. And since I've removed this drawing the full screen image on the OLED display, it was actually running quite fast, so I added a simple sleeve for half a second so it's not updating that fast. So the only thing left to do at this point is to press the run button and see the temperature here in the shell window as well updating on the display itself. Actually all three displays at the same time. Since each display has a different brightness it was hard for me to adjust the camera setting for all three at the same time so if you see blinking on the OLED display that's not there that's only for the camera. Now if you disconnect the Raspberry Pi from your PC and connect it in again, you will not see the same program running and that's because by pressing this run button we are only copying the program into RAM of the Raspberry Pi, not uploading it to the flash memory. So if you want to see the program running after you plug in the Raspberry Pi into your PC or power source, you have to first save it on the board. And you do it in the way that you select file, save as, and select Raspberry Pi Pico. And the important thing is to name it properly and the name has to be main.py. So if you save it as main.py, you will see it here in the Raspberry Pi Pico list. Now when you disconnect the Raspberry Pi board and connect it again. Again, could be to your PC or any power source, it will run the same program again. And that's it for today's tutorial. If you have any questions or comments, please put those down in the comment section below this video. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Thanks and bye.